Thank you all so much for joining us um, for tonight's presentation. My name is Emily Voss. I am the Senior Manager of National Programs and Professional Development at the Center for Civic Education. And this is a joint program this evening called Voting and the Civil War. Uh, and it, I'm joined by Sarah Brearley, and we'll introduce her more formally in just a moment, but she is with the American Battlefield Trust. So we're very excited to be able to bring this program to you as this year was the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Cedar Creek, which we'll get into in more detail. Um, our webinar tonight will explore the intersection of voting and the Civil War, um, but also talk a lot more about the unique voting circumstances during 1864, um, especially including soldiers' participation in the democratic process. And so we will go from there to a lesson demonstration um, where the Center for Civic Education has created an inquiry based lesson plan on the 26th Amendment. So yet another uh, momentous part of American history, heavily influenced by young people's involvement in a major conflict. So um, with that, let me introduce my co presenter today. Sarah K. Brearley works in the Education Department at the American Battlefield Trust, and she has spent years exploring ways to share quality historical research in ways that will inform and inspire modern audiences, including school presentations, writing, and speaking engagements. Sarah has published four books and has two more under contract, so we're excited to have her here joining us this evening. So Sarah, I will hand it to you. Thank you so much, Emily. It's great to be here. Um, our thanks to the Center for Civic Education for inviting American Battlefield Trust to join you for this program. Uh, the American Battlefield Trust is a nonprofit that focuses on preserving battlefield land and creating free education resources um, with a focus on the early years of American history, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, and the Civil War. Um, and what we're going to be focusing on tonight, as Emily shared, is the 1864 election. So I I'm going to go ahead and attempt the screen share. Hopefully technology is on my side. Uh, if it is not showing up right, I will ask Emily or Mark to let me know, but I think we're good to go. So let's dive right in. We're going to talk about voting. We're going to talk about some battlefields during the American Civil War, and they actually do intersect. There was voting that happened on some of the fighting ground. So we're going to be talking about that this evening. Now, the American Civil War is fought between 1861 and 1865. There is a lot of political turmoil um, in the years leading up to that conflict, of course, a lot of discussion about what to do about slavery, what about expansion of slavery or just expansion as a country with new states um, being formed out of the territories in the West. How is that going to balance power or imbalance power in Congress? Presidential elections were very important. In the 1850s, we see the emergence of the Republican Party. You see the end of the Whig Party, emergence of the Republican Party. Um, you have the what starts off as the Democratic Republican Party um, shift through different phases in the early part of the 19th century, become the Democratic Party. And so we have uh, the two party system is in place by this point in American history and a lot of conflict um, stakes. Uh, political stakes are high in the years leading up to the Civil War and during the American Civil War itself. Now, the 1864 election is going to be one of those circumstances, a very unique point in American history, where only a few states are going to be participating in the election, because 11 states have declared themselves out of the Union, saying they want nothing else to do with this system of government that the United States has. They say they formed their own separate government, the Confederate States of America. They have a president, so why would they be voting in the election for a president? of the United States if they no longer consider themselves part of that country. So we have some really interesting things going on on the electoral map. Also, it's an interesting moment when you have a lot of citizen soldiers away from home. Do we do absentee ballots? How do we handle a soldier's vote? And of course, the stakes in the 1864 election are high. We'll get into those a little bit more. The continuation of the war with a victory that would bring the country back together 
or a quicker route to peace that might allow a divided nation and slavery to continue. These are things that are on the ballot, part of the party platforms in the election of 1864. But let's center it a little bit, because by 1864, we're years in to the Civil War conflict. So things have already happened. Where are we at with what's happened in the military campaigns? Well, the war begins in April 1861. We have the early battles like Bull Run or First Manassas, Wilson's Creek um, in 1861, and of course, other conflicts as well. I'm not going to list all of them. I would encourage you to visit battlefields.org for a more comprehensive timeline of the American Civil War and links to lots of different political issues, battles, conflict, those sorts of things in this era. But moving along on our timeline, in 1862, we see battles beginning to become larger in scale. Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee, um, fights around Richmond, Virginia. The bloodiest single day in American history is the Battle of Antietam fought in September 1862. And it's that Battle of Antietam that's going to give President Lincoln the opportunity to promise freedom through the Emancipation Proclamation to enslaved people who are in the states still in rebellion. If the war has not ended, if those states have not returned to the Union by January 1st, 1863. The war does not end. Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation officially making freedom from slavery a war aim for the Union cause. It does not abolish slavery in the country. It will take the 13th Amendment to the Constitution to do that. But it has put slavery as a ending slavery as a war aim for the United States, for the Union cause. It also allows Black men to enlist and serve in the armies, in the navies of the United States. In 1863, on battlefields, we see the Confederacy, those states that have declared themselves out of the Union, cut in two as the Mississippi River comes under control of Union forces following the capture of Vicksburg, Mississippi in the summer of 1863. Also in the summer of 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg takes place, seen as one of the large turning points of the American Civil War. Now we'll come into 1864. You have a divided nation that has been in conflict for several years now. 1864 is where we begin to see coordinated efforts of Union armies to plunge deep into the heart of Confederate state territory, begin to capture chunks of land, secure strategic victories, and really start bringing this war, um, hopefully, to a close. The end of the war, of course, does not come until 1865 with the surrender of various Confederate forces across the area. 1864, big campaigns happening in this year. We have the Overland Campaign that goes through the central part of Virginia. We have the um, Atlanta Campaign, which will result in the capture of that Georgia city. These are campaigns with large, costly battles, and all of this is going to play into the political scene that unfolds in 1864. A resource that might be useful and that is used in many classrooms um, is available for free on the American Battlefield Trust website, and this is our 1864 virtual reality experience. So it puts you as a viewer in a trench. It lets you see in a non-graphic way, but an insightful way, what soldier life is like in a Civil War trench what it might be like to be sent out on a patrol, what it might be like to be lying in a field hospital. So again, these are created um, in a way that are useful for classrooms. We have a full lesson plan that supports us. If you want to dig a little deeper into Civil War soldier experiences in 1864, I've included a link for this in the PDF of links and resources that I think will, has either already been shared with you or will be shared right after this program. Um, so you can watch this experience as a regular video, an interactive video. If you have virtual reality goggles and want to use them, it works great that way, but you don't have to have them for an insightful experience. And as I mentioned, lesson plans to go with it. So that can let you take a step into the shoes, if you will, of a Civil War soldier's experience in 1864. But while those campaigns, while those military actions are occurring, there's the election. And the election is on the minds of soldiers and leaders, both in the North, the Union, and the South, the Confederacy. So 
voting is going to take place in the northern states. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about voters. These candidates are presenting themselves to the states still within the Union, not to the Confederate states. And the platforms and the candidates involved in the 1864 election will be on the Republican side, um, incumbent President Abraham Lincoln. They change out as vice president, though. It's not going to be Hannibal Hamlin anymore. Instead, it's going to be Andrew Johnson from Tennessee. Part of this is the effort of kind of a coalition of groups. Um, the political parties in the United States splintered quite a bit during the Civil War. So Republicans are trying to unite with Democrats who are still willing to pursue a war effort and victory reunification of the country through that war effort. So they will actually form what's technically called the National Union Party. It's a lot of Republicans there. So for sake of ease, I will refer to them as the Republicans here. But be aware, they've brought in a coalition. They're making... Um, some deals, if you will, um, with Democrats who are willing to pursue this victory and reunification of the country. Now, the Democrat Party platform doesn't align with their candidates' beliefs. Their candidate for president is George McClellan. He was a very popular Union general in 1861 and 1862. He's out of Army command um, by 1863, 1864, but he still is popular with the troops. Now, McClellan thinks it's a good thing to finish the Civil War with a Union victory. However, his running mate, uh, George Pendleton, and his Democrat Party platform are putting forward an idea of peace. This could take different forms depending on which splinter of the Democratic Party uh, you would be talking to. Some are willing to make peace at any cost, even if that means letting the southern states go and continue to be that separate nation that they claim to be. Others are willing to do a peace treaty. Let's get peace. Let's bring the country back together and sort it out later. Let's get the country back together but keep slavery. There's different parts of this. But there's a big plank in their platform that is peace. McClellan isn't in favor of it, but he's kind of stuck. He remains as the candidate, and this is how the election is going to be presented as the nominees are made, as campaigning, uh, political campaigning uh, heats up and gets exciting, particularly in the newspapers. In this era of American politics, the candidates themselves don't go out and campaign. Instead, other members of their political party um, or factions of those political parties go out, make speeches on their behalf, um, raise support. It's an era of lots of political excitement, but the candidates themselves are not out making speeches. They rely on others to sort of represent them and the party platform. Now, there's some challenges. This is not a typical election in 1864. There's questions that people are debating. Should they just delay the presidential election? Well, this has never happened in American history. There was no delay of the election in 1812 when the War of 1812 is starting to heat up. So there's not a precedent for delaying the election. And ultimately, they will decide, nope, we're going to have the election. Well, then comes the question, which states get to vote? Obviously, the ones who've declared themselves out of the Union, they're not going to get a vote in this. But what about those states, particularly Louisiana and Tennessee, who had seceded, had joined the Confederacy, but by 1864 were occupied by federal troops? Do they get to vote? These were questions that were going to be debated um, in the newspapers, by political leaders, by citizens themselves in 1864. Then, of course, is the question, who is eligible to vote? This is a period where states get to say who's eligible to vote. Um, we can safely say, blanket statement, women are not allowed to vote in the 1864 election. However, there's some northern states that allowed African-American men to vote. So interesting things. You bring soldiers together with different backgrounds. If you're from this state, do you get to vote? But wait, I'm from this state. Does that mean I get to vote? There's lots of different qual voter qualifications um, that we find in the electoral process in mid-19th uh, century. So keep those questions in mind. Then, how will the soldiers themselves vote? You have thousands of men from northern states who are not at home, who want a say 
in the political moment. What they say with their votes may also directly impact if they are sent into battle again or if there's a quick peace settlement. So how will the soldiers get to vote? Should they get to vote? And if so, how to make that happen? These are questions and challenges related to the 1864 election. So bringing up that question, should Union soldiers vote? Looking at newspapers and other primary sources of the era, there is huge debate and large-scale fear and 19th century conspiracy theories that there would be a lot of fraud if the soldiers were allowed to vote. It is very interesting to look at these debates. People wanted to make sure that it was going to be a fair election and that the votes were accurate. Perhaps something that sounds familiar into our own era as well. Let's look at a primary source. These are posted on the American Battlefield Trust website. I've included links for them in that resource document that I mentioned. So there is a newspaper editorial that reads this way, should soldiers vote? The question, allowing our Pennsylvania soldiers in the face of the enemy to have a vote will be presented to the voters who are at home on the second day of August, 1864. This is for us to decide who have not proved traitors in arms, but remain secure in our homes. How shall we decide it? Their voices cannot be heard in the decision of this boon of all freemen. They, the soldiers, are in the face of death-dealing foes who are battling against the Union, liberty, and American nationality. Can we say they shall not vote with us for the man who is to be president or governor or congressman or sheriff or any other officer? When he has proved himself more worthy because he has assumed and is performing duties to his country involving life and health at every step. Are we such arrogant coward as to say, you may fight for us, be killed or maimed for life, suffer in hospitals or rebel prisons, but we do not mean that you shall vote while doing and suffering for us that we may avoid like hardships. I'll pause there. Um, you can read the rest of it if you like, but we can see the home front grappling with this question, saying we get to decide by a vote if the soldiers defending us and our nation will get to vote. Um, this editorial appeared in the Adams Sentinel and General Advertiser, which was actually a newspaper published in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where a large scale battle had taken place the previous year. So we can see these questions. Here we get the home front view. We can ask inquiry questions. You may already have your favorite sets of inquiry questions to use um, with resources, but I would present the simple ones of what stands out. What concerns might sound familiar um, to concerns we hear in our own era about voting? Um, is there something in this primary source that helps us better understand United States elections and how we got to places that we are today? So once states had made decision, if states made the decision that soldiers could vote, then the question was how to have the soldiers vote. How do you handle the logistics of thousands of men getting to vote, then making sure that those votes get back to the states and are counted properly? And this is where those um, 19th century conspiracy theories of fraud just run wild. And it's on both sides, which is very interesting to look at in some of the, the resources. Now, keep in mind, this is an era where it's not a secret ballot. Voting is still considered a very community event. You know who your neighbor's voting for because you see the ticket that he's carrying up to place in the ballot box. You see which ballot box he puts it in. So this is a very interesting and different way of voting than we experience it today. Yes, there's lots of people who are willing to share who they're voting for. Maybe they have bumper stickers, a sign in their yard, but some of us maybe don't advertise who we're voting for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but it's a little different. It's a different voting culture in this era. So keep that in mind. There are states that allowed for absentee ballots to be used by soldiers in military service during this 1864 election. There were other states that said, nope, we're not doing it through the mail. We're not doing the voting in camp. Instead, figure it out. If you want to vote, you have to come back to your home state, to your hometown, and cast your vote there. 
And in this case, we do find that there are officers who are beginning to allow those soldiers from those states to take short furloughs in the autumn months to go home and cast a vote. There's a primary source, um, this one coming from the New York Times in the spring of 1864, that's talking about the challenge of how to carry out a soldier's vote. The method by which the soldier's vote shall be sent from the field and deposited in the ballot box at his home proves a puzzle to our legislature. A bill has been reported by a select committee which provide that the ballots shall be enclosed in envelopes and marked on the outside soldier's vote and that such envelopes may be sent in the mail to the inspectors of election in the district where the soldier resides any time within 60 days before the election. This proposition seems very much like offering a chance for cor to corruption. Why, so why should the soldier's vote be thus advertised or exposed to such risk from mail farriers, post office officials, or election inspectors? Would he, the soldier, be willing to thus hazard his money? Certainly not. He would demand it as his right to send it to a friend whom he could trust if he wished to deposit it in bank, and the legislature could not deprive him of this right. Is a citizen's vote of less value than money, or is it less his own or less under his control? It strikes us that our legislatures need to remember that it is his, the soldier's vote, and not their own, that they are dealing with. And this is a great way to bring in a discussion. What is the value of a vote? And how important is it that individuals get to cast that vote and have a certainty that it is going to be collected and counted properly? So then we find the question, who will the soldiers choose if they are able to vote? We have George McClellan, that previously popular Union general. We have Abraham Lincoln, the incumbent, who's been leading the nation through the war already. The Lincoln campaign uses a slogan about not changing horses in the middle of the stream. So if you're crossing a stream and you're on one horse, why would you jump to another in the middle is kind of the folksy analogy that they're presenting. Why change presidents in the middle of the crisis? And that concept is going to become really important when we look at the military situation and this we win uh, we will get the war to an end with a victory that brings the country back together, which is what Lincoln is um, advocating for, and that is part of the Republican Party platform at this time. So the questions of who will they choose, and we find soldiers talking about this in their letters, in their diaries. Um, this excerpt um, comes from a letter written by William Kelso, who served in the 116th New York Infantry Regiment. And part of his letter was printed in a newspaper. So think about sharing this paragraph from a soldier's letter in the local paper. What's that saying both to the local community and also about the soldiers' opinions in camp. So this is what Kelso writes. There is a great deal of talk about the election among the boys, and I have had some stiff old arguments, but I am generally enough for them. There are a good many of the boys that are tired of fighting and would like to have peace and get home on any terms. I do not mean the majority of our men here by any means. I mean a class of unthinking individuals who enlisted without ever giving a thought to what hardships of a soldier's life and who would now vote just as unthinkingly for a peace president without ever giving a thought to what would be the result. But when a fellow gets down amongst and talks reason to them and pictures out a peace with withdrawing all of our troops from their territory and what would be their next step, they generally cave in and go for old Abe and for licking them, the Confederates, out, if it should take three more years." If you are as sound for old Abe at home as we are here, no fears for the result. In fact, I have none in any way. Lincoln must and will be elected again. And the emphasis there at the end is original. So we have soldiers writing to the home front. We also have women writing about the election. Women can't vote in 1864, but they are intensely interested, some of them, in the election process. They go to political gatherings, they listen to the different speeches, and they write about them. And they write about them to the soldiers in the camps as well. 
So for example, Elizabeth Lockley wrote, wrote to her husband after attending various political meetings, I think Lincoln will be reelected. I trust so, for I think he has shown that he will do what is best for the interest of our country. I fear McClellan is too easily led, has not the stability nor punctuality for the position. Tis said that Lincoln is not dignified enough. That may be so, but we will gladly put up with his lack of dignity if he will only guide our, our back safely through these troublous times. Elizabeth Lockley has an opinion on the election. She actually tells her husband at one point that she thinks she would want to vote in this election. And I find it fascinating that she would, if she could have voted, she's saying she would have voted for Lincoln, which means she's voting that her husband has to stay away longer, but she's thinking for the good of the country. There are other examples of women writing to their soldiers talking about this. Um, one of my other favorites is Emma Randolph, who was engaged to a soldier named Walter Dunn, and they correspond very freely about politics and their opinions. And Emma actually encourages Walter to make sure he votes. And Walter says that he would vote for Lincoln as well. So some interesting examples of women influence, influencing the vote, though they could not actively cast a ballot at this time. So we have all of these questions. We have the absentee ballots, soldiers being able to vote in camp, and I'd like to bring it in to a regional era, the Shenandoah Valley, which sits in the western part of Virginia. In the autumn of 1864, there's an important military campaign that unfolds in this area. You have Union General Philip Sheridan, whose image is at the top of the screen, going against Confederate General Jubal Early, his photo at the bottom of the screen. The Shenandoah Valley is a region that has been fought over for all the previous years of the Civil War. It's an area where very few Union victories have occurred up to this time. It's a strategic location. It's also an area that produces a lot of agricultural supplies that are used by other Confederate forces in Virginia. Sheridan is tasked with conquering the valley and destroying those food logistics, destroy the food supply in the region. And we're going to see a string of Union victories in the autumn of 1864. On September 19th, the Third Battle of Winchester. September 21st and 22nd, the Battle of Fisher's Hill, another Union victory. The Fisher's Hill opens up the Shenandoah Valley region, and there's a period that we refer to as the burning, which is that systematic destruction of the crops and supplies in the area. Burnings of fields, barns, not civilian houses, that was not allowed, um, but a lot of destruction occurring in this region. On October 19th, Confederate cavalry is defeated at the Battle of Tom's Brook. So we've just seen a string of Union victories in this region. Pair that with the capture of Atlanta, a major Confederate city that happened at the beginning of September 1864. In August, end of summer, there had been the capture of Mobile Bay in Alabama. You also have Union General Ulysses S. Grant pinning Robert E. Lee and Confederates in place at Petersburg, just south of Richmond, which was the capital of the Confederacy. All of these events, all of these military actions are pointing toward there could be an end to this war with a Union victory. Maybe you don't need to settle politically with the Peace Democratic Party platform. Maybe there's an end to this war in sight with a victory. In the camps of Union soldiers in the Shenandoah Valley along the banks of Cedar Creek, there is voting that is taking place in October. The image at the top of the screen is how some of the fields around Cedar Creek looked in the 1880s. The photo at the bottom is from a reenactment and living history event that actually occurred in that vicinity uh, last weekend. So apologies for the cars there in the camp, but imagine thousands of tents spread over this landscape, Union soldiers fresh from their victories in the Shenandoah Valley gathering to cast ballots in an orderly way in their camp. One of the men who is intensely interested in the vote is General Rutherford B. Hayes. He will later become president of the United States. But in 1864, his home state of Ohio had actually nominated him to represent them in the United States Congress. 
Hayes accepted the nomination, but he said he would not go serve in Congress until his military service was over and a union victory had been achieved. He's very um, emphatic about that. So we have Hayes and his soldiers casting ballots in their camps. On October 19th, 1864, Confederate soldiers led by Jubal Early launch a surprise attack against the three Union camps around Cedar Creek. Don't get bogged down in the details of the map, but notice we have red arrows and blue arrows all over the place. This is a confusing battle day. Union soldiers are literally woken up by Confederates attacking their camps. They get up and they start running to find safety. They start, Union soldiers are running to then rally and be able to fight back. It is an October surprise of immense proportions for the Union men at Cedar Creek. The Confederates are making a gamble. Early realizes that a Confederate victory, even if it does not have huge lasting effects, if he can get a Confederate victory in the Shenandoah Valley, that would change headlines in the North. He's hoping to influence the election by his military action. In many ways, that's a big part of what happens at this battle on October 19th, 1864. In the midst of the Union rush to get away from their attackers, there are officers and men who grab the ballot boxes and take them with them in their retreat. They are saving the vote, literally. Well, by midday, a lot of Union soldiers have stopped their retreat. They're starting to form solid lines. The arrival of their beloved commander, General Philip Sheridan, further enthuses them. And in the mid-afternoon, there is a Union counterattack, which sweeps back across these battled fields. And Union camps are regained by sunset. Confederates are pushed into a final retreat um, in the Shenandoah Valley. So this huge moment, we see what looks like a Confederate victory by midday and a quick turnaround to a Union victory by the time the sun sets. It's a very dramatic moment. And Sheridan is going to play up that drama, both for his own gain and for political gain, for the Republican Party, for Abraham Lincoln, in the headlines. They don't use the phrase, or at least as far as I can tell, they don't use the phrase October surprise in the way we recognize it in our modern politics. But in many ways, Cedar Creek is an October surprise. It puts another Union victory in the Northern headlines. This is a boost for Lincoln. And more importantly, there is not a headline of Confederate victory that gets into those headlines as well. So um, it is a significant moment, and there's something very dramatic about thinking about saving the soldiers' votes in that moment where it looks like defeat might be happening, but then a Union victory by the end of the day, which does have an influence on the election, which is literally weeks away. So what about the election results in 1864? Yes, we're glossing over a lot of information, but I want to be able to hand it over to Emily here for her portion of the program. So let's get to the results because we know what they are in this case. Well, Abraham Lincoln wins the presidency again. He will remain in office. He won 55% of the popular vote, um, gained 212 electoral votes, and of the soldiers who were allowed to vote, Lincoln got 78% of the soldiers' vote in the 1864 election. McClellan, and I'm going to say poor McClellan here, he had a rough time. He got three states, electoral votes, Kentucky, Delaware, and his home state of New Jersey. Not as many soldier votes either for McClellan. Um, so Lincoln is going to have a second term. He, his second inauguration takes place in March 1865, and then just weeks later, he is killed by assassin John Wilkes Booth um, at Ford's Theater and dies on October 15th, or excuse, pardon me, April 15th, 1865. And his vice president, Andrew Johnson, will then, of course, become president, and we'll see Johnson's presidency play out in the tense period of the, re of the beginning of the Reconstruction. So a lot of things at stake in the 1864 election, a lot of big results because of what happens. One thing that I'd like to point out is the age 
of voters. We've talked a little bit about who could vote, who could not vote. And we have a lot of young soldiers in the Civil War period. Voting age was 21 in 1864. The enlistment age was supposed to be 18. Now there's a lot of younger teenagers who get into the ranks of both armies during the Civil War. But this brings forward a question that we can think about is what about voting age? Um, and if an 18 year old is willing to fight and die for his country in the Civil War and can't cast a ballot either for Lincoln or McClellan, that's something that we can think about. And it may tie into a larger discussion about civics that might be interesting to your students. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Emily and I think she'll take us in a modern direction. Thanks so much. Absolutely, I sure will. And I wonder actually, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind addressing a quick question from the chat, um, which relates to the relationship of the American Battlefield Trust and the Civil War Preservation Trust. Oh, of course. So the American Battlefield Trust has had several name changes over the years. Um, so yes. Um, in more recent times, Civil War Preservation Trust, Civil War Trust, we are the same organization. Um, a few years ago, they changed the name to American Battlefield Trust because we're doing more preservation and education work connected to the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, which is really exciting. So if you have been a long supporter of some of those other names, please know we're still the organization. Uh, we are still preserving battlefield land. We're getting close to 60,000 acres and thousands of free educational resources for you at battlefields.org. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, well, and thank you also for, for queuing up my portion of the, the presentation so beautifully. So I'll uh, also share my screen. And I'll just do a quick introduction for anyone who's joining us this evening who is not already familiar with the Center for Civic Education. We are dedicated to promoting civic knowledge, skills, and dispositions among our students so that they can become active and informed participants in our democracy. And two of the ways we do that are through our flagship programs, We the People and Project Citizen. But we also have many, many free resources, one of which I will be diving into in just a minute. All right, so our approach to all of our instructional materials follows an inquiry approach. So this is very, very briefly the 5E e model, which allows students to build on engagement through exploration and elaboration and evaluation. The students essentially work more and more deeply into a particular subject matter and uh, develop a much deeper understanding as a result of that process. So as Sarah mentioned so beautifully, voting in the Civil War versus the modern era, this is a, a great entry point for students. So you can breach this topic whether you are working on a unit to do with elections, whether you are working on a unit to do with the Civil War, or whether you are working on a unit that has to do with uh, the evolution of voting rights in the United States. So we're going to talk today about the 26th Amendment in particular and the lowering of the voting age. And so what we have for you today is an inquiry lesson based on the 26th Amendment. So essentially, we're going to just cover this lesson in brief, but it will cover kind of a history of voting rights in the US, the 26th Amendment and the ongoing debate should the voting age be lowered even further than 18. So just looking at the constitutional voting rights alone, I do think it is very fascinating to consider the relationship of those three amendments to wars. So we have the 15th Amendment that is passed following the Civil War, which allows uh, voting rights to be extended to all men, regardless of race, at least on paper. The 19th Amendment is certainly heavily influenced by women and World War I. And then the 26th Amendment passed in 1971 will very, very much be influenced by youth involvement in the Vietnam War and the protests against it. So taking a quick look here at the 26th Amendment, you know, Sarah mentioned here we have at the point of the Civil War, 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 20 year olds who are 
either voluntarily or drafted into the army who cannot make any decisions on the leadership of the country, despite the enormous impact it's having on their own lives. So the 26th Amendment is passed in 1971 in the midst of the Vietnam War. Young Americans, once again, are being drafted. Some are voluntarily joining the army. But the slogan that really pushes the passage of this amendment is old enough to fight, old enough to vote. And so this amendment will lower the voting age from 21 to 18. And it is one of the fastest amendments to be ratified in US history. It was ratified by the states in just 100 days. So we're certainly very motivated. So in this particular lesson, which uh, we'll also be sharing the link to, students are, this is a two part lesson. Um, so students are going to take a look at why the 26th Amendment in particular was adopted. They are going to look at some pro and con arguments uh, for lowering the voting age, and they'll defend their position as to why they think that the vo voting age should or should not be lowered. Um, so I'm just going to walk through this with us. It again follows the 5E model that will allow the students to uh, get greater and greater depth into the lesson. Uh, the day one lesson is focused on the entry to the 26th Amendment. So a great kickoff for this lesson is to just encourage students to think about examples of times when they would have voted for anything, whether it's voting on where you should go to dinner, voting on the team captain, or possibly voting for something outside of school in a, another leadership organization like the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts. But chances are the students have voted on something at some point. So it's a nice entry point for the lesson. And so that's a, a good kickoff to then discuss what, what is essentially an age appropriate to using voting as a means of making decisions. This will then lead into a guided inquiry. So you're going to pose the question to the students, should the voting age in the United States be lowered? So the students can take a position. You can use Jamboard for this. You can use post-it notes for this. Uh, but you're going to save the responses for the end of the experience. So I am just curious uh, for those of us here tonight, what do you think just right off the bat? Should the voting age be lowered to 16? I'm just going to say 16. We don't have to debate about younger, but feel free to drop in the chat your thoughts. I've got, I'm just going to keep a tally of the, the marks here. So we've got some no's. All right. This looks like a collective universal vote so far. All right, excellent. Now I wish I could actually do this whole lesson. Um, Steven says no to 16, but yes to 17. Man, okay, I wish this program was longer so we could get into that. Um, but I would love you know, for you to try this with your students and, and have their opinions as well. And you can use this lesson for middle school students as well as high school students. So it is very interesting to ask a middle school student this question. Um, it's a lot of fun to see what they think. So you'll you'll move on from this, you know, sort of temperature read of the room, yes or no, the students can vote. Um, now we're going to take more of a look into what factors lead to the 26th Amendment. So the students can discuss or predict based on their previous knowledge why the voting age might have been lowered at that time. Um, the lesson plan does include a video that you can share with students that does explain how and why the 26th Amendment was passed. And then you can work through those reasons with the students afterwards. So there's additionally a slide deck called Old Enough to Vote, where the students will look at primary sources and secondary sources to further engage with that material. And there's a graphic organizer for them to use to collect the evidence and share out their findings with the rest of the class. So it's really engaging and it certainly does encourage the students to do all sorts of different research into this topic. So final day one activity is to just rehash what was the top reason for the 26th Amendment's passage and to support their answers with evidence. So you can sort of leave your day one there and then you would move on to day two. 
So with day two, now we have had prior information the day before about why the 26th Amendment resulted in the voting age becoming 18. Um, and now we're going to dig more deeply with the students into whether it should be lowered further still in 2024 or at some later time. So um, I wanted to just share like one or two minutes of this video just because I think it's a terrific resource and it frames the question really nicely for students. Uh, and Mark has also very kindly put the lesson plan in the chat for us, but we're just going to watch a couple minutes of this video. When you turn 18, our society generally considers you an adult. You can join the military, you're eligible for jury duty, you can get that sweet tattoo that we all know you'll regret in five years. And of course, you gain the right to vote. That's when you finally get a say in how this country works. But over the past few years, with movements like Black Lives Matter and the March for Our Lives, we've seen young people under the age of 18 put pressure on lawmakers to take action on serious issues that affect them, like police brutality and gun violence. Combine that with the fact that at 16 you can work, pay taxes, and even be tried as an adult for some crimes, and it's pretty obvious that the country's laws have an impact on nearly everyone well before they can cast their vote. Maybe we need to rethink the voting age. Should 16-year-olds be allowed to vote? Okay, so voting may not seem like a big deal, especially since there are a ton of eligible voters out there that don't vote. I'm looking at you, millennials. But it's kind of awesome that in America, voting is a right. I mean, 40% of the world doesn't even have the option to vote, which means they don't have a say in their government. However, the laws governing who can vote and who can't have evolved over time. When the Constitution was... Okay, so he does go through the voting rights. You get the idea. But um, it's a really, really terrific short video. It runs about six minutes. It lays out really nicely the you know pros and cons of potentially lowering the voting age. And it also concludes by pointing out that there are some local elections that do allow people younger than 18 to vote. So it's a, a nice framing of the issue right. for the students. All right, so, you know, once again, you'd have this compelling question that you could bring to the students, you know, should the voting age in the US be lowered? Discuss. And I would imagine there's going to be a lively discussion around this matter, especially if you started out by by watching that short film. And I think there's, you know, a greater opportunity then for the students to explain further and discussion and share their thinking what factors might play a role in interesting people to lower the voting age. They can revisit the historical context from the day before uh, where they looked at the 26th Amendment and, you know, again, debate the issue further. So the day two activity is more of a structured debate. So you'll have your class divided out into four teams. Two teams are going to create arguments for, and two teams will create arguments against lowering the voting age. They are going to be expected to utilize primary and secondary sources for their research. So not just what they feel like, but doing good research here. And so that part can take as long as you need it to. If you actually wanted to take this lesson into a third day, you certainly could, or you could already have resources pulled aside for this discussion. The students will have a graphic organizer again to organize their thinking. And after the group research, the students on the teams can share their findings and basically give, give their arguments pro or against. So you'll wrap up with that full group discussion and revisit the whole supporting question. All right, and then you could, as Sarah did before and as I did, you could bring back the connection between the past and the present, um, essentially drawing that through line for students to say that the, the fight for voting rights is a fight that that started 200 years ago, and it certainly is a discussion that we are still having today. We had this discussion during the Civil War. Um, you could bring in a discussion of other wartime elections. How did the election of 1864, for example, compare to the election of 1944? So lots of different uh, avenues that you could take if you chose to extend this lesson further. Um, you can also have a modern debate about civic engagement and the voting age and 
how young people continue to shape the future of democracy. So whether or not 16 year olds are ever granted the right to vote, what are some options for young people today to continue to play an active role in our democracy? So really, really great two day lesson that that ties this all together really nicely. And I think really hits at students personal interests. All right, so with that, both Sarah and I would be happy to answer additional questions. I was able to cover my section a little bit uh, more quickly. So I do wanna make sure if anyone would like a certificate of completion for today's program, um, please send me an email. My email is voss at civiced.org. And I will be sending everyone regardless uh, the PDF of all of the resources that Sarah put together for American Battlefield Trust. Um, I'll also be sharing our resources as well, although the links are also shown here on your screen. The lesson that I talked through, the lowering the voting age, that has its own link. We also have four brand new teaching resources on other topics to do with voting and elections. Uh, that were just published within the last month. So there's a separate page there where you can also access all of those free voting and election lesson plans as well. So with that, I am going to open up any questions that you all may have for us this evening. And you can either drop the questions in the chat or if you wish to take yourself off mute, that's fine too. I'm just going to say some really, uh, uh, really good resources uh, uh, with both of you. Uh, uh, I would think a very timely as well as uh, uh, definitely find themselves in the toolkit for uh, uh, for middle as well as elementary. So uh, nicely done. Thank you very much, Glenn. Yeah, it's I think both uh, both of our collections of resources are very applicable to middle and high school. U.S. history classes, government classes, civics classes, the whole the whole spectrum. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. This is not exactly uh, uh, maybe for the center, but uh, for you, Sarah, uh, could you? Uh, well, let me let me ask it this way. I'm so I'm from Kentucky, and I know. Um, with our like counties, you know, just records and stuff from back then that for some of the elections, they claim that certain people were prevented from voting by fellow citizens or potentially from government officials. Could you speak um, to that topic at all? I don't care which state, but just in general. Thanks, Joel. That's a great question. Um, it's not something I've studied in depth recently, mm -hmm. so I don't want to misspeak here for you, but um, there was certainly a lot of political pressures and intimidations that we find um, in 19th century voting. And this is before the Civil War, during and after. I think a lot of people focus on the voter intimidation during the Reconstruction era. Um, but there was also intimidation that happens in the antebellum period and the civil war years itself of course so i think it's something that would maybe be worth another <laughs> discussion that we could go a little more in depth on sometime um but yes it's certainly there i do not have any specifics on it for kentucky or specific data or stats that i could point to for you tonight if you want to drop me an email i could uh, see if i have some other resources to send your way if you'd like though yeah thank you very much thanks joel great question And Sarah, I just put your your email in the chat there. Thank you. You beat me to it. <laughs> I appreciate it, Emily. Any other questions for us this evening? We certainly appreciate your engagement with us in the chat. Okay, well, I think we may wrap things up then. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening and please be on the lookout for future programs from the Center for Civic Ed as well as the American Battlefield Trust. 
Um, we have webinars at least a couple times a month. Uh, so we hope to see you in the future. And I'm sure that the American Battlefield Trust would love to see you at some of their future programs as well. So thanks again. And we will be in touch with those additional resources, if not tonight, by tomorrow. Thanks a lot, everybody.